on Thanksgiving's Eve. A plane was hijacked, he extorted $200,000 in ransom. And parachuted to an uncertain fate, the FBI investigated for 45 years, with no results. This case was known to be the only unsolved case of air piracy in history. So, what happened in this case? Now, let us travel back to 1971. On a seemingly normal Thanksgiving Eve, a middle-aged man approached the counter of Northwest Orient Airlines. He was wearing a business suit with a necktie and carried a black briefcase. He identified himself as Dan Cooper, and he used $20 cash to purchase a one-way ticket on Flight 305, a 30-minute trip north to Seattle. After that, he boarded a Boeing 727-100, a predecessor of the 737. The plane was capable of carrying 131 passengers. It is mainly used for short to mid-range flights. The design of Boeing 727 is a bit different from the planes we see today. Instead of boarding at the side of the plane, passengers boarded by using a ramp at the back of the plane. Back then, there was not much airport security checks, it was simply like riding on a bus. Smoking was even allowed back in the 1970s. After Cooper boarded the plane, he sat at the back of the plane, at seat 18C. He ordered a cup of whiskey and soda water and started smoking. At 2.50 p.m., Flight 305 departed Portland with 36 passengers and 6 crews. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a handwritten note to a flight attendant, seated nearest to him. Florence Schaffner, was 23, and she was pretty. So she assumed that he was hitting on her, and mindlessly put the note in her pocket. Seeing this, Cooper leaned towards her and whispered. Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. She looked at the man's eyes. She can tell that he was serious. The note read. Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I want you to sit by me. Trying to calm herself, she sat next to Cooper. Cooper opened his briefcase, she saw a tangle of wires, a battery, and six red sticks. It was a bomb. Cooper calmly told the steward. Please tell the captain. I want $200,000 in cash by 5 p.m. I want all of them to be in $20 bills. Put them in a backpack. I want two back parachutes and two front parachutes. When we land, I want a fuel truck ready to refuel. No funny stuff, or I'll do the job. She ran to the cockpit to tell the captain. After hearing this, the captain immediately contacted the air traffic control. And the traffic control contacted the other related departments. To ensure the safety of the passengers, the president of Northwest Orient Airlines, Donald Nerp, authorized the payment for the ransom. And he ordered all employees to fully cooperate with the hijackers' demands. After getting notified by the air traffic control, the pilot made an announcement. To keep the passengers from panicking, he did not reveal the truth. He told the passengers that they are experiencing a minor mechanical difficulty. And their arrival in Seattle would be delayed. After that, the aircraft circled in the air for around two hours. Giving time for the FBI to prepare Cooper's parachutes and ransom. And they also recorded the serial number of all the banknotes. At 5.39 p.m., the plane landed at Seattle Tacoma Airport. It was raining at that time, and the passengers already knew the plane was being hijacked. But due to Cooper having a bomb, no one dared to make a move. After landing, Cooper ordered the pilot to move the plane to an isolated, brightly lit section of the apron. To prevent getting shot by FBI snipers, he ordered all the passengers to close the window shade. A Northwest Orient staff approached the aircraft wearing street clothes. This is to avoid the possibility that Cooper might mistake his airline uniform for the police uniform. He delivered the cash-filled backpack and parachutes to Cooper. Once the delivery was completed, Cooper ordered all passengers, Florence, and senior flight attendant Alice to leave the plane. During refueling, Cooper outlined his flight plan to the cockpit crew. It was a southeast course toward Mexico City. And he also made a few unusual requests. Including flying at 100 knots, and maintaining at a maximum 10,000 foot altitude. He also requested that the landing gear remain deployed in the takeoff position, with the wing flaps lowered to 15 degrees, and the cabin remain unpressurized. The pilots told Cooper that the plane does not have the range required to reach Mexico City. After discussion they agreed to refuel at Reno, Nevada. After that, Cooper made one more demand. The plane's rear exit must remain open, and its staircase extended. But the pilot told him that it was dangerous. 
and Cooper compromised, allowing the pilot to open the rear exit once they were airborne. The pilots noticed that this hijacker was very knowledgeable in aviation, and seems like a professional. At 7.40 pm. It was raining hard. The hijacked 727 took off again. At this time, there were only five people on board the plane. They were, the pilot, co-pilot, mechanic, flight attendant, and Cooper. There were five people on board, but Cooper only asked for four parachutes. The crew was scared, fearing what he would do, but he still have the bomb, so they had no choice but to comply. After taking off, the US Army deployed two F-106 jet fighters. One flying above the plane, one below, out of Cooper's view. One T-33 trainer jet was also diverted from an unrelated air mission. But it ran out of fuel and left. Cooper demanded all the crew to stay in the cockpit. And not to come out without Cooper's permission. At around 8 pm. A warning light flashed in the cockpit, indicating that the rear exit has been opened. The crew offered assistance using the aircraft's intercom system, but he adamantly said no. This was the last word heard from Cooper. At approximately 8.13 pm. The aircraft's tail section sustained a sudden upward movement, significant enough to require trimming to bring the plane back to level flight. The crew immediately asked Cooper if he need any assistance, but there was no reply. At 10.15 pm. The plane continued flying and landed on Reno Airport, with its staircase still deployed. The FBI and police surrounded the jet, and did a quick armed search. But he was no longer aboard. Now the FBI realized. The plan to fly to Mexico was merely a decoy. Using his extensive knowledge in aviation and terrain, it is very likely that he had already planned his escape. Learning about the hijack, the media rushed to the airport hoping to report the news. When they were first reporting it, one reporter mistakenly wrote, Dan Cooper as D.B. Cooper. And it led to the other reporters to mistakenly report his name as D.B. Cooper as well. When they noticed the mistake, the name was already out. And so, this was known as the D.B. Cooper case. The FBI immediately conducted their investigations. First, they interviewed Florence Schaffner, the person who had the most contact with Cooper. Florence described Cooper as calm, polite, and well-spoken, not at all consistent with the hijacker stereotypes. He wasn't nervous, Florence told investigators. He seemed rather nice. He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. When he ordered his whiskey, he even let me keep the change. The FBI later interviewed the three pilots following the flight, and they never saw anyone parachuting. When the FBI entered the plane, they discovered that Cooper left behind a black tie, a tie pin, and two remaining parachutes. And they also discovered 66 unidentified fingerprints on the plane. Besides these, there were no other clues. After interviewing the flight crew, the FBI believed that Cooper parachuted at 8.13 pm. As the crew has noted there was an unusual movement of the plane. And the FBI confirmed that dropping 200 pounds of cargo, the ransom, would cause the plane's tail to move upwards. Combining this information, the FBI believed that his landing zone was a few miles southeast of Ariel, Washington, near Lake Merwin. So, the FBI coordinated an aerial search, the search lasted for a few months, but there were no findings. After that, the FBI expanded their search area to nearby towns and started an extensive ground search as well. And they found a skeleton in an abandoned building. But it was later identified as the remains of a teenaged girl who had been abducted and murdered in an unrelated case. This search was arguably the most extensive search in US history. Yet they uncovered no significant material evidence related to the hijacking. Since the FBI couldn't find any useful evidence, they tried to analyze the case. And they noticed that Cooper acted very professionally in the entire hijacking. But it does not look like that Cooper have much experience in parachuting. At that time, it was raining hard. Some experienced parachutist claimed that they would never make a jump in those conditions, since it was extremely dangerous. At night, the visibility is already very low. And with the pouring rain, it would be very difficult to accurately determine his height, and the timing to open his parachute. And if he had a plan to escape, it would be very difficult for him to reach the landing zone. Despite allocating huge amounts of resources to investigate this case, the FBI never made any significant progress. But around 10 years after the hijack, the FBI received some unexpected clues. On November 1978, a sign printed with instructions for lowering the aft stairs of a 727 was found by a hunter near Lake Merwin, not far from the estimated landing zone. 
The nearby area was searched once again, but no more discoveries were made. Two years later, on February 10, 1980, an eight-year-old boy was camping with his family on the Columbia River near a beach. He discovered a broken bag. Opening it, it was filled with disintegrated $20 bills. FBI technicians later confirmed that the money was indeed a part of the ransom. The FBI estimated that this bag was dropped in the river during the jump, and floated onto the beach. The FBI conducted an extensive search on the beach, but nothing else was discovered. The FBI kept most of the $20 bills as evidence, but they allowed the boy to keep a small proportion as the reward for discovering it. And they later sold for a crazy amount of money to collectors. In 2017, with improved technology, the FBI identified rare earth minerals, such as cerium and strontium sulfide from the Thai. Back in the 1970s, these elements were very rare. But there was one company that uses these rare elements in aviation. It was Boeing. Combining his extensive knowledge in aviation and this clue, it is very likely that Cooper was a former Boeing employee. The FBI used 45 years, investigated over 1,000 suspects, but the case was never solved. A month after the hijacking, the FBI announced the serial number of the ransom, asking the public to inform the FBI if they discovered these banknotes. Until this day, you can still check the serial number on this website. But it has already been 50 years since the incident. To date, none of the 9,000 remaining bills were discovered. On 8th of July, 2016, the FBI announced that they were suspending active investigation of the Cooper case, quoting that the FBI will focus its resources and manpower on more important and urgent cases. Until this very day, the case was never solved, leaving behind tons of questions. Did Cooper die that night? How did he escape? Is he still alive? Perhaps. This will forever be an unsolved mystery. <laughs>